Greetings all. I have been asked by Bernard over at Military History Visualized to do a quick assessment of the fightability of the Panzer III Model H and the T-34-76 Model 41. So here it is. Now of course uh, there is a lot more, as I keep harping on about, to what makes a tank effective than simply the stats of the armor value of the gun and so on. And this is a perfect case in point. So, for example, when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, the Soviets had on paper almost as many T-34s as the Germans had medium tanks, period. It was like near just shy of a thousand T-34s. The Germans had, uh, I'm thinking, 900 Panzer III's and 300 Panzer IV, something like that. Plus, of course, all the associated Panzer II's, uh, 38Ts, and so on. Yet somehow the Soviets got their arses kicked, at least as far as Moscow. And there's a lot of reasons for this. One of them is that the Soviet tankers had absolutely no clue what they were doing because they weren't allowed to train on the vehicles very much. Uh, it's rather depressing. They had, uh, if I recall, of the 900 and something vehicles officially on hand on the 1st of June, 840 of them had never been operated outside of factory acceptance trials. They were sitting completely unused, which of course means that the crews weren't training. Uh, there were, of course, a higher level problems after the purges. The Red Army was still trying to figure things out. Uh, there were the reliability problems. The early T-34s were horrendously unreliable. And the Germans, of course, didn't have this problem. But even when the tanks met each other, and this happened on day one, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that the T-34 really only saw combat in August or at the gates of Moscow, it was only literally basically a Hoths group um, ran into T-34s basically from the start. Yet they don't seem to have made much of an impression. Why is this? And a fightability is one of these reasons. So if you were to look at the Panzer III, which I would argue was the best tank in the world at the beginning of World War II, uh, you, can, you can make an argument for the Panzer IV, but it was still at the time, it was just an infantry support weapon more than anything else, really. Um, the Panzer III was a very good tank with its flaws. I'm not going to say it's a perfect tank. I mean, if you had to change your transmission on it, God help you. But I, in my 1 meter 98 self, fit very nicely in the Panzer III. I can operate a Panzer III, no problem, any position. Uh, it's very good for me. And so, of course, the average German crewman of the time would have been very comfortable and very effective. Not so much for the T-34s. Now, again, I'm going to keep my commentary here primarily to the Model H Panzer and the Model 4041 T-34s. The later T-34s are an entirely different beast. The T-3485 is fantastic vehicles. Again, they have their flaws, but they, they were very, very good in comparison to the vehicles that the Red Army was mucking around with when the Germans decided to go pay them a visit. By way of a case in point, uh, the Panzer III was originally designed to come with a 5cm gun. Uh, correction, to take a 5cm gun. They didn't have a 5cm gun to put into it because the funding was not made available until 1938. So once 1938 came around, money came around, and they start developing the 5cm KWK L42. Of course, development and actually putting into the vehicle are two entirely different things. So the 5cm didn't actually start hitting the field until after the invasion of France. Uh, so this wasn't a case of, oh my God, we've met Char B1s and R35s and Matildas, we need a bigger one. They were always gonna work on this. and. The fact that it started off with a 37 was just an unfortunate situation. On the other hand, whilst the Panzer III was designed to take comfortably a 5 centimeter gun and work well, the T-3476 was not. The T-3476's heritage comes via the A-20, which was a basically 45 millimeter gun, and the A-32, which was a small 76 in the same turret as the A-20 effectively. So what you have in the T-3476 is you have a 3-inch gun in a turret designed for a 45 mil. You can immediately see why there is a problem here. And that's before you get to uh, some other issues, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, there are, of course, a couple of knock-ons from this. So take, for example, rate of fire. The official rate of fire for the T-3476 is 5 rounds a minute, I think. 
and they tested it. I mean, in acceptance trials, when they're testing out the vehicle, and the Russians sent them out, and they said, okay, here's your tank, there's your target, start staying in rounds. And they did, and they figured out about five rounds a minute. And there was a problem with this. This wasn't exactly combat condition. This was a stationary tank, and they had the rounds had been unpacked and prepared for the commander, I guess, the loader commander, to sling them into the gun. They also did operational trials and said, okay, if we were going to go into simulated combat, how quickly can we uh, get rounds downrange? And the answer was two rounds a minute, one round every 30 seconds. And there were a couple of problems with this. One, of course, is that the tank is now bouncing around and he's got a big round that he's trying to extract from stowed ammunition positions and not great. Uh, the next problem, though, was that engaging targets is not simply a matter of how quickly can you get around in and pull the trigger. You've got to find the target. You've got to land the target. You then have to observe your effects on target. And if the commander is slinging rounds into the tube, he is not doing any of the rest. So he's got to stop doing the one job to do the next. Example. Uh, there was a T-34 that famously took 23, I think it was, 37 millimeter rounds to get knocked out. Uh, and this was a frontal engagement, the 37, the door knocker, which, by the way, was a lot more effective against T-34s than uh, people assume. Uh, but from the front, it had its shoes. And so the 37 is going plink, 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 and finally they get a, a lucky shot in that jams the turret ring. And this is viewed as an example of the toughness of the T-34's armor. And it's a good thing. Why on earth did a T-34 crewman let the Germans fire 23 rounds at them before servicing the 37? And the answer is basically because they didn't see them. And if they did see them, they certainly didn't uh, get an effective round on target. And this is because, again, the commander is busy doing many things. And looking out for the enemy is only one of them. He had other problems as well. So, uh, again, in the testing of the T-34, the optics came in for a fair bit of slagging uh, from the testing staff. They were not satisfied with the visibility that came from the T-34. From any position, from the driver, from the commander, from the gunner. Uh, the all-around sight had a... 120 degree field of vision which is fantastic if it wasn't obstructed by a few other things it did have the advantage that it was a, there was a periscopic site that uh, you could ambush from hold down positions but again you have a couple of problems with the crew overload and a lack of training so the t-34 crews couldn't properly use it uh, the germans at least well they had a cupola, so the TC could find the targets. The gunner did not have a periscopic sight, which was a failing of many German vehicles. Although, curiously, the assault guns did not have this problem. And they had pretty reasonable optics. Good, good clarity and a relatively wide field vision from the optics that they had. So they could find the targets much faster. They could service, uh, lay on the target much faster. And they could pump more rounds at the target. And that 5 centimeter 42 was not um, inconsequential against T-34s. Might have taken a couple extra hits, but it was certainly better than the 37, and a fair few T-34s would be knocked out by them. And remember, this the T-34 and the KV was not the first time that the Germans came up against tough targets. They had this problem with the British and the French over a couple of uh, months earlier, on the other side of the continent. And the Germans figured out, yes, there are ways of killing these tough tanks. And it's not as if they forgot these techniques when they went over to the Soviet Union. And this is why a, a large number of Soviet tanks were knocked out. There are other ergonomic problems as well. So again, let's say the armor. I've mentioned the sloped armor on the T-34, and this is universally hailed as a revolutionary or a good thing. There's nothing revolutionary about it. Sloped armor goes back to World War I. You look at an FT, it's sloped. You look at a German A7V from World War I, it's sloped. It's not as if the Germans didn't understand sloped armor and then the Soviets had this epiphany of sloped armor. Your problem is volumetric. When you slope the armor inwards, 
you are stealing room from inside the tank. Room that can be used for stowing ammunition, room that can be used for stowing crewmen, room that can be used for giving crewmen a little bit of elbow room to operate efficiently. And even the Soviets realized eventually it was a stupid idea. Look, the successor to the T-34 is the T-44. How sloped is the armor on a T-44? And they went the same way as most other countries had started going, such as on the M, you know, the M2 medium, the you know, predecessor to the Lee or the Sherman or some of the British vehicles. They sloped the front because that's where they wanted the hits to come. They didn't bother sloping the sides. It's not worth it. The Germans, well, they knew about sloped armor, as I mentioned, but they realized that you have these problems, and given the weapons that were going around at the time, if you just slope at maybe 10 degrees, you are going to get the protection that you need without all the liabilities and limitations to come with it. Now, eventually, of course, as I say, both countries came to a, a compromise. The Russians stopped sloping the sides, and the Germans started sloping the front a bit more. So both, you know, yeah, 50-50, win-lose of both sides. Then you have the suspension. The Germans, of course, have the torsion bar suspension. And the Soviets did not. They had the Chrissy suspension, which, again, is universally hailed as a good thing. Compromise. Uh, there are pluses and minuses. Yes, the Chrissy suspension had its very definite positives. It was also a fairly old suspension system, torsion bars, as will be evidenced by the fact that we're still using them today and Chrissy has long gone. Um, yeah, when the Soviets were mucking around, one of the factories, I believe 183, said, look, we've realized that if we replace the Chrissy suspension with torsion bars, we get an extra 20% internal volume, which we can use for stuff, like ammunition or fuel. Uh, it was going to be, I believe, a 50% increase in fuel alone. Because if you look at the inside of a T-34, it's a nice wide tank on the outside. On the inside, there is a lot less space because you've got to have about this much room on each, on each whole wall, which is just taken up by the suspension. Now, granted, you can also put some fuel uh, tanks in between as well. But uh, they take up space. They, they, are, they can be a maintenance headache, just as the British when they started moving to Christie suspension. And... Well, the, the Russians didn't like it, so they came up with the torsion bar version, the T-34M, which was supposed to start production about 1941. But then, of course, the war happened. They couldn't do it. and So they finished off the war with their Christie suspension tanks. And again, what happens when you get to the T-44? Vroom, goes away the Christie suspension. In comes the torsion bar. They get more room. Now, there is a positive for the T-34 over the Panzer III. And that is the drive shaft. The T-34 had the complete power pack, well, technically not a pack, but a complete power system at the tail. The Panzer III didn't. The Panzer III had the engine at the back, the transmission at the front, and you had that shaft going all the way forward. And of course, there is no turret platform. Uh, certainly, you got places for your gunner and your commander to put their seats, but uh, poor old loader, if he's got to be reaching for things that are not conveniently located, he's got to watch where his feet go. But he does actually have a place that he can sit. And the rounds are small enough that it's not so necessary for him to be on his feet anyway, because they're, they're easy enough to manhandle inside the tank. And of course, he's got all this room on his side of the tank. So there you have now your space has been taken up by the suspension. Your uh, armor has taken up space. Your optics aren't what they should be. Your crew are completely overloaded. There are issues, of course, simply with operating the vehicle as a driver. And the gear shift is famously bad, uh, especially the first few hundred vehicles. Although they started to fix that a little bit. God help the bow gunner who can't see a thing. Uh, and has no hatch of his own, so God help him if he has to bail out. Um, I think you can see where I'm starting to go here. The T-34 on paper was a fantastic vehicle, and it would eventually develop into a very good vehicle. 1940-41, though, it was nowhere near capable of living up to what the paper statistics said it could. The German vehicle, well, that was designed and was as capable of what it was designed to do. 
So that is a, a good reason why, especially once the uh, 60 caliber 5 centimeter came out on the Panzer III, why I would still rate the Panzer III to be a better vehicle than the Q34 at the beginning of the invasion of the Soviet Union. Now, T3485 versus Panzer IV, you start coming across different issues. And that is uh, another assessment I will save for a future time. Anyway, uh, I hope that gives you an impression of uh, some of the non-hard stat advantages and disadvantages of the two vehicles. Uh, and again, I've left things out. I've left out reliability. I've left out uh, the turret traverse. The T-34's turret traverse, even on the early models, was very fast, very good. But you couldn't do a fine lay with the power motor. You had to go to the manual controls to do it. The German vehicles were very accurate, although perhaps not quite as fast on a traverse. The pluses and minuses. Um, radio communications, the T-34's radios were notoriously bad at the beginning. Uh, when they had them. Uh, th the problem is overstated uh, as to the availability of radios, but there were definitely issues with the early models that were coming out. German radios worked fine, and you, you can see how this ended up happening. So, in addition to all the other problems that the Red Army had, the last one was that the T-34 wasn't the wonder weapon that people thought it was.